I'll apologize up front. I'm uh, less than 48 hours in Germany from the West Coast, so I'm a bit jet lagged. I also picked up a cold along the way, so I'm probably going to drink both these waters as I, as I go through the talk. Uh, real quickly before I get started, a show of hands in the audience, number of people who are running production workloads in either AWS or GCP or Azure. Okay, about half the audience or so. Um, okay, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Eric Onan. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at a company called Cloudability. Uh, I predominantly have a distributed systems and operations background. The majority of this talk is going to be sort of operations focused in terms of how we scale my team at Cloudability. Um, we'll go into a, a little bit about what Cloudability does as a product, but I'm not going to try and dwell on that in this talk. Uh, this is more focused on how we've actually changed some of our own internal operational policies. Uh, so a, a real brief history uh, about Cloudability. We were funded in 2010 in Portland, Oregon. Portland, uh, if you're not familiar, is between Seattle and the Bay Area on the West Coast. Um, we, uh, our mission in life is to help our customers make the most effective use possible of public cloud, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about what I mean by public cloud in a moment. Um, we are a pure SaaS offering, which means we don't operate a data center. Everything that we do is completely based in AWS. For the most part, we run a little bit of our inf infrastructure in uh, GCP, Google Compute, but for the most part, uh, every bit of our offering is operating in Amazon Web Services, and that'll be the focus of this discussion. Uh, that said, most of what I'll talk about today is fairly applicable to the other major cloud computing platforms. There's not very much that's AWS-centric in this talk. It just happens to be what we use to operate our infrastructure. Uh, one thing I did want to emphasize is that as a startup, we followed what I would characterize as a pretty typical startup path, meaning in the early days, we grew very quickly. Uh, and if we encountered certain problems, usually we tried to just spend our way out of those problems. We didn't really focus on engineering first principles, per se. We were trying to ship features very quickly. And uh, that was what we favored. Um, we also did what was comfortable, meaning what did the team at the time understand, how to operate, what were they familiar with, use those technologies, uh, ship features as rapidly as possible, get them to market, test them, and move on. And over time, that becomes something that uh, that sort of neglect for how we're using cloud resources is something that uh, ultimately will catch up with you, and, and that's going to be a big part of the focus of this talk. So if I could sum up this talk in terms of memes, it would be two things. Uh, I will be playing the, the role of the old man yelling at the cloud, or Grandpa Simpson. Um, but effectively, this is a, a journey of how we got good at operating AWS Cloud. And so when I joined the company in 2015, we were doing what we needed to provide value to our customers, but we weren't really keeping our own house in order. And we, over time, had to learn how to properly operate cloud so that we could, uh, like we try and do for our customers, extract the maximum value out of uh, how we were consuming cloud resources. So uh, very quickly, I'm going to cover some terminology that I'll, I'll throw around a lot of acronyms in this talk so that I can not uh, articulate them every time. I'll do a, a quick history of our use of cloud computing, and then I'm going to go through uh, a high-level overview of what we changed in terms of how we operate our own internal teams. That will then play into sort of our journey of cloud efficiency uh, and some specific changes that we made. And uh, then we'll dig into some specific case studies around areas where we had pointed improvements, where we want to improve, how we're using cloud, and uh, I think we'll have a little bit of time for QA at the end. So some high-level uh, terminology. Uh, when I say public cloud, I, I may use that interchangeably with a term called PaaS. That's an acronym for platform as a service. Uh, I basically mean the same thing for both of those. And in every case, you can look at that as either AWS, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, or GCP, Google Compute Platform. Uh, that's, w at least in the context of this talk, what I mean when, I, when I'm talking about PaaS or public cloud. Uh, oftentimes, there's a negative connotation around public cloud. People think, oh, it's insecure and it's not well managed. Uh, that's a bit of a misnomer. In every case, uh, these days, modern best practices would have some sort of software-defined networking, like VPCs and firewalls and various platform services in front of things. Just because it's public cloud doesn't imply an inherent level of insecurity. Uh, this talk is also about efficiency. So uh, efficiency in this regard means if I spend a dollar with a cloud provider or I spend a euro with a cloud provider, am I getting the maximum value for that dollar? Am I operating my infrastructure well? And then there's another component of this talk, which is scale. And scale will have two meanings in this talk. Uh, the first meaning is sort of the traditional meaning of as our infrastructure grows, as we're operating more resources within public cloud, uh, are we able to do that without making significant changes in our engineering infrastructure? But it'll also refer to scale in terms of how my team operates, meaning can we do more with fewer people? Or can we continue to grow the business uh, as a meaningful platform without needing to throw a bunch of headcount at the problem, hire a bunch of people? Uh, can we continue evolving our business without significant pain? Um, Efficiency and scale are definitely not uh, always going to co-occur, especially in an early stage startup. So uh, while we may be able to scale, 
easily by throwing money at a problem. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we're efficient in terms of how we use cloud resources. Likewise, you can be highly efficient and be completely unscalable. So you can be super efficient, spend very little money in cloud, but not be able to scale your business or your infrastructure, not be able to bring on new customers easily. Uh, and so evolving both of those at the same time is really where a lot of the secret sauce in this talk comes in. And then I'll, I'll often use the term compute resources. Uh, that just basically means there's a thing that we're paying for, uh, in our case, in AWS. So most commonly, people think of that, think of resources as an EC2 node, but resources could also be something like an auto-scaling group, or it could also be an ECS cluster. Uh, pretty much anything that Amazon is going to charge you for would, would be categorized as a resource in the, in the terms of this talk. So if you could uh, put yourself into a time machine and uh, rewind about 10 to 15 years, uh, this is largely what my life looked like. I literally spent lots of time in data centers. This is not me. This is actually a picture of the Oregon um, Google data center uh, that they run with uh, GCP Cloud. Um, but effectively, I spent a lot of time in racks in data centers, spending many years sort of honing the craft of how do we operate data center infrastructure. Uh, this, you know, when I started engaging in the industry, uh, there weren't things like Puppet and Chef. Config management was really just sort of getting off the ground. And over time, we learned, okay, well, how do we operate data centers well? It was an unknown thing. We eventually got better at it. We thought we had the discipline mastered. And uh, and we sort of plotted on. Then along, starting in about 2007, up through 2009, we started seeing AWS uh, really emerge. And, and that sort of changed a lot of things in terms of what we thought we knew about how to operate our infrastructure. So uh, when I joined CloudAbility, uh, one of the things that I initially did was step back, look at our infrastructure, look at how we were operating things, and see where I thought we needed to pay some attention. Uh, and effectively, at the time, in 2015, we were operating our data center like a cloud. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, it means a number of things. There's a handful of examples that I can point to. We, we never really trued up decisions or reconciled value, meaning uh, if a team spun up a handful of EC2 servers, did we step back over time and look at those EC2 servers? Were, was it a good decision to use the instance size that we used? Was it a good decision to use the family that we chose? Were they well utilized over time, or did somebody just spin them up and walk away from them? If it was a test environment, was anybody even paying any attention to that over time? Uh, we didn't really have any sort of science around capacity planning. So if we needed something, we clicked a button, we turned it on, we provisioned the resource, but we didn't step back and say, okay, well, what do we think we're trending over time? What do we expect, where do we expect to be in terms of our consumption of cloud resources, say, 12 or 24 months out into the future. Uh, in, uh, I'll also point out that our, our platform, in terms of the service that we're offering, was not being very adaptive to changes in the AWS ecosystem. So uh, if you don't follow what Amazon is doing with AWS, they're innovating at a breakneck speed. They're constantly shipping net new products. Uh, over the last 12 months, they had over 1,000 major new releases. That's not necessarily like, like a net new product, but that would count as sort of a minor product iteration release or taking a net new product to market. Uh, and we, we, quite frankly, weren't being adaptive and taking advantage of the services that the platform was bringing to market. Uh, another concrete example of this is we were running one virtual machine per workload. So, for example, we had an asynchronous consumer that was reading a message off of a queue. We would have a deployment unit that would deploy to a, uh, one or more virtual machines that would consume that queue, but that was kind of the extent of it, right? We wouldn't have, say, multiple workloads running on virtual machines, and oftentimes if something was working, we would step back and not touch it and then move on to the next task at hand. Uh, this is Effectively, not all that uncommon in terms of how you would operate a data center, but for all of these things, I would contend that these are not the right way that you should be operating uh, efficiently in public cloud. And then there were a handful of other things that we needed to change. Uh, at the time, we sort of lacked accountability or ownership over resources, so it was not uncommon to go find a server running somewhere, and we knew how it was configured because it was in our, our Puppet infrastructure, but uh, we weren't quite sure who the actual owner of that was. So if something was running it in the red and it was at 100% CPU utilization, it wasn't necessarily easy to go track down who was responsible for that service. Um, we had very little financial leverage of our infrastructure, and I'll get into what that means in a bit more detail as we go through the talk. And uh, quite frankly, our growth in cloud spend was not sustainable. So uh, we were spending significantly more and more each month with Amazon as we grew our business, and we needed to step back and assess, why is this the case? Is this something we can actually get under control, or is this something that's just going to continue to spiral forever and we need to figure out what to do? Uh, and lastly, we wanted to be able to tell an authentic, credible story. So. Uh, 
at the time in 2015 uh, and running into 2016, we had a great platform for our customers, and we were helping them manage their cloud, their cloud sort of resource utilization efficiently, but we weren't actually applying those same best practices to our own internal uh, use of cloud. And so that's what the majority of this talk focuses on, is, is how do we actually change our operational policies to make better use of cloud. So there were, there were a number of changes that we enacted. Um, in particular, we changed some team structure, we changed uh, our, some fundamental pieces of our architecture, we changed our basic approach to how we do operations in the cloud, uh, and then we changed our approach to cloud usage in general. So to dig in a bit more there, uh, our team structure, we effectively reorient, reoriented our teams to be much more functionally aligned around pieces of our architecture. So one of the offerings that we have for our customers is uh, analytics around how you're consuming cloud resources. And uh, as any good analytics companies want to do, we have a data ingestion pipeline that pulls data down, uh, moves it into sort of a data warehouse type infrastructure. I'll, I'll go over some details of what that pipeline does, but at the time we started this sort of team reorientation, we didn't actually have a clear owner of the pipeline function, nor did we have a clear owner of, say, the analytics function. We had what would traditionally be called full stack developers, and everybody kind of dabbled in every piece of the infrastructure. And so we set out to sort of to specialize in certain areas of the architecture and to have better accountability around those areas of the architecture. We implemented what is commonly called an SRE model, uh, Site Reliability Engineer is the acronym from Google. And uh, what this means in short is that if you're writing a piece of code, you are going to be the one that deploys it to the production environment. You are going to be the one that is accountable for when it alerts, if it breaks in the middle of the night. You are the one that's going to get paged, not an operations team. And we push that accountability down into individual development teams. Uh, as part of that, each of these functional teams that owned a part of our architecture uh, was responsible for KPIs around efficiency. And we'll go into some examples of what those look like, but uh, KPI being a key performance indicator, and you could look at this as an example of this would be, um, are my utilization of my EC2 servers above 75% or more? Or am I just wastefully spinning up new EC2 servers when I don't need them? Am I letting them linger and not turning them off when I don't need them? Am I being elastic with my infrastructure? Uh, those are some examples of KPIs that, that we implemented for individual functional teams. Uh, and then lastly, we also had for each team uh, a notion of a unit economic that they were responsible for providing to the business. And I'll provide some concrete examples of that a bit later. Uh, on the architectural front, we made a conscious decision to specifically embrace native cloud platform and tools. So um, there's going to be a lot of concrete examples of that in the talk, but effectively we wanted to stop ignoring what AWS was doing around us and to leverage that as best as we possibly could, while also focusing on things that we were good at uh, and adding value on top of the platform, but not just operating infrastructure for the sake of operating additional infrastructure. Uh, and in certain cases, we wanted to identify opportunities where we could actually simplify some of our architecture uh, and maybe relax some needs as they were related to the business, and there'll be an example of that a bit later in the talk. Um, in regards to the operations team, we completely revamped that function within our infrastructure. So we wanted our operations team to, rather than being a barrier or somebody who received a piece of code from an engineering team, we wanted our, our operations team to actually be an enabler. So we set out to make sure that they would become the experts in platform capabilities, meaning they're responsible for keeping tabs on what Amazon is doing. They then take that, they digest that, given their knowledge of our internal systems, and they actually become a leverage function for our engineering teams. So they may see uh, a change in an auto-scaling group, for example, and in the way Amazon manages CloudFormation templates relative to auto-scaling groups, and they'll turn around and produce an example of that back to the engineering team, offer that up as, hey, here's something that you could leverage that we think would help this particular service that you're maintaining. Uh, their job was no longer to operate code for people, it was to more impactfully enable the engineers themselves that were actually deploying code. Uh, the ops team does still, in our environment, have responsibility for shared services, so things like our ELK stack, our log aggregation, our metrics monitoring and alerting infrastructure, they sustain that, inf that infrastructure, but it's a tool that is used by individual engineering teams themselves. Uh, and then they kept some traditional duties as part of this uh, in terms of mo <clears throat> being security resources for the teams. Uh, but the key takeaway here is that we really changed them from being somebody who's on the other side of the fence, somebody who's in sort of an adversarial contentious relationship, to being an enabler for the engineering teams and a partner to the engineering teams. So that, that's the, oh, sorry, I, glanced, I glossed over one last thing. Uh, originally, the, that last bullet point was eat our own dog food, which is sort of an industry saying, uh, my marketing team didn't like that, so we called this drink our own champagne. Um, but this basically means take our own product, apply it to how we operate our infrastructure, and feed that back into our product to make it a better, stronger product based on how we're actually doing the thing that our product is meant to do. So 
Uh, the remainder of the talk is going to go through what I call the, the journey of cloud efficiency, and it's broken down into four stages. Uh, I'm going to frame this relative to our specific experience with AWS, but I can tell you from uh, what we see from our customers, this is a very common sort of evolution in terms of how you adopt cloud infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the stages themselves uh, aren't really measured by any metrics, so that sort of up and to the right gradient in the area underneath that doesn't really quantify anything. It's just meant to convey a level of sophistication and a level of effort that you need to put in to continue uh, doing cloud well effectively. So the, the first tier visibility is a pretty straightforward thing, but you'd be surprised how many people don't get it right. And it really starts with just simply tagging all the resources that you're using inside of an infrastructure. And that probably sounds like a pretty obvious thing to this group, but I've lost track of the number of customer deployments that I've seen of our software that had little to no tagging policies. It's to a point where now best practice in the industry is basically to terminate an EC2 instance if it doesn't adhere to a tagging policy when it's launched, and to do that as quickly as possible. So, for example, uh, one of our customers, you literally cannot launch infrastructure in their environment unless it meets a specific tagging policy around that EC2 infrastructure. Uh, if you adhere to this, this then has a lot of side benefits and side effects that you can build on as you move through this journey of cloud efficiency. Uh, but it really does start with tagging. Unfortunately, we can't tag everything in AWS today. There are just some resource types that cannot be tagged, but Amazon usually fills those gaps pretty quickly. And I would also argue that this is a net new thing in terms of the ability to tag resources and the precision that we have around resource visibility is not something we had back in that data center world. So it's a bit foreign if you're coming from operating a data center at scale in terms of how you operate your cloud infrastructure, this notion of adding decorative metadata around resources and things that let you put resources into meaningful groups is, is a relatively new and learned skill that, that we've had to adopt. Um, once we have tagging, then we can start to put resource consumption into groups along with those functional teams. So we can actually start to get a better sense of how an individual team is consuming resources on the cloud. You can contrast this with previously everything was just kind of thrown into a production environment account or a staging environment account or a dev environment account, but you would have to go track down individuals and say, are you operating this server? If so, yes. Okay, great. Now I understand that this dollar amount goes to this team, but where does everything else go? With proper tagging, we can actually start to put cost and resource consumption and utilization into buckets that belong to a team, and then have more meaningful conversations with those teams about what they're using, what they're spending, where they think they're going with their infrastructure. Uh, one of the nice side effects of this is that now that we can quantify how an individual team is behaving, so for example, to contrast our pipeline team with our analytics engine team, or our recommendation team, when one team has a key breakthrough in terms of how they're operating infrastructure, they have a quantifiable thing that they can look at and they can say, for example, we started using Spot. And by using Spot instances, we were able to reduce our cost by 75% for this workload. Uh, that then becomes a bit competitive with other teams. They see that benefit, they see that measured impact, and they step back and say, oh, okay, how could we implement something similar on our side? And overall, everybody benefits once you've got sort of measured consumption of resources in the infrastructure. So stage two is what we typically call in, in our little corner of the industry financial leverage. And I won't spend too much time digging into this, but uh, effectively financial leverage in terms of public cloud amounts to if you make a commitment to spend a certain amount of dollars, you can get discounted pricing. And uh, in the Amazon world, this is known as RIs or uh, reserved instances. Uh, that's a bit of a misnomer these days. The industry is quickly converging away from the notion of I want to have discounted pricing for a single host. And what's actually happening now is that people are adding up base compute units. So you could look at this, for example, and say, of all the EC2 hosts I'm running, I have 1,000 CPU cores that are part of that infrastructure. And of that 1,000 CPU cores, if I take a probabilistic model around how our resource consumption is changing over time, I can actually project that I think I'm going to end up keeping, say, 750 of that thousand. So I want to cover 750 of that thousand with discounted pricing by making a commitment. Uh, in our case, we were able to leverage our own tool, drink our own champagne effectively to uh, attain about 90% RI coverage for specific workloads. And for each of those workloads, immediately out of the gate, we get a 30% saving with zero engineering effort. We're driving our price down by 30% just by figuring out what do we think we're going to continue to use over time. But the nice thing is recently we've been able to step away from is this server going to step around and look at in aggregate what are the compute units we're using, how many of those compute units do we think we're going to keep over time and divorce that from the idea of specific hosts. <coughs> uh, two other things I'll throw out there real quickly. Um, 
sorry, one other thing I'll throw out there real quickly, something that a lot of people overlook in terms of financial leverage is the secondary market. It's one of my favorite things about AWS, this notion that I can go buy a reserved instance from AWS without that dur extended duration commitment. So to put an example on this, uh, this morning I ended up buying uh, about 30 reserved instances with just a 30-day window for one of my teams. Uh, 30 days is pretty small. I'm, I'm comfortable making that commitment. It's a lot different than making a 12-month commitment for 30 reserved instances. And I was able to save them, uh, I think it was $2,000 without any involvement on my time. So about five minutes of my time saved that particular team um, <clears throat> $2,000 or so. So if we look at the extent of the journey, uh, the first two stages, there's, there's a, a deliberate dividing line between the first two stages. And the reason for that is we can attain the first two stages in terms of visibility and financial leverage without really involving the engineering teams. We don't need an engineering team to come in and write code. We don't need to change our operational policies per se. Tagging is quite straightforward once you get it baked into like a chef infrastructure or into some basic AWS configurations. But to really continue to do cloud well effectively, to attain more cloud efficiency, now we have to start looking at changing the ways that we actually operate the infrastructure and getting the engineering team involved. And that's what stage three and stage four are going to be about. So uh, as we dig into stage three, how we changed our operational practices, we're going to look at a handful of specific initiatives that we kicked off that allowed us to continue to extract more value out of cloud, to continue to have uh, more efficiency. Excuse me. So initiative number one, uh, we effectively, when we kicked off this broader effort, we stepped back and we looked at different workloads across our environment and decided where we wanted to target some specific places that we weren't happy with, whether that was how much those areas were costing us. Keep in mind, now we have good visibility into which pieces of the architecture are costing us money. And we could put pointed efforts behind reducing spend in certain areas. Or if we had certain areas where we weren't happy with the architecture, we could step back and say, how do we make this more cloud native? How do we use best practices of cloud as opposed to what we've been doing for the last four or five years? And so the first one of those was effectively re-architecting our data pipeline. So uh, two years ago, we had something that looked similar to this. We had uh, a, a data ingestion set of servers that would run some jobs on a periodic basis. They would integrate with AWS. They would pull down CloudWatch metrics. They would pull those in. They would write them to a React time, uh, basically a time series schema on top of a React cluster. Uh, at its peak, that was upwards of 30 different nodes, uh, 30 nodes running on some pretty significant infrastructure. At the end of the at the end of its life, it was running on larger I2 infrastructure. Uh, once the time series data had been written to React, we'd put a message into Rescue. We would then have a different set of hosts that would pick up that message out of Rescue, uh, then go read the data back out of React, start to process it, and ultimately write it into a MySQL data store. Uh, there were a number of problems with this architecture for us. Uh, the first one being that a lot of the data ingestion side of things and a lot of the rescue consumers were frequently idle. They would, be, they would wake up, they would do some work for maybe 15 minutes, and then they would basically go back to sleep and nothing would happen for 75% of the time on these hosts. So we had sort of burst scale that we had to deal with, uh, but the way that we were operating at the time, we weren't scaling up or down, we just had a fleet of machines that would wake up, grab some data, put it into a database, and then go back to sleep. And so, uh, what we ended up changing that architecture to was to be uh, significantly more cloud native. So uh, now the way this looks today is we have Lambda functions that run on a cron schedule. So there's no sort of self-scheduling that's done as an independent function. Those Lambda functions have a tiny bit of state that they need to maintain, which they write into DynamoDB, just so that we know when certain fetches are happening, et cetera. Uh, they now write messages into uh, SNS topics or SNS queues as opposed to rescue, which is sort of another facility that AWS provides for us. Uh, and then the consumers of that are effectively operated on top of auto scaling groups. Those auto scaling groups are backed by spot instances uh, as opposed to long running durable EC2 hosts that we have to reason about are we going to keep them around forever. In, in this case, this workload spins up in, result to a mess or in response to a message being in a queue processes some data, and then effectively those hosts go away. And because we're doing this on spot, we, save up, we end up spending about 25% compared to what the on-demand rate is uh, for a similar workload. Likewise, we got rid of the time series database altogether. So these consumers that are reading from CloudWatch are effectively buffering data. They'll then write that into S3 files. Uh, one of the nice facilities of S3 is that when you finish writing a file, you can have AWS subsequently emit an SNS notification. So a different message goes out into a different SNS queue. And then we have a second set of consumers that are running on ECS in the form of Docker containers that will read that message out of the queue, process the file, write a different file to an S3 bucket, 
Uh, this case, it ends up being a parquet file format, which we then push further downstream. So a couple of benefits of this. One, it scales elastically. So as there's more workload, things scale up, they do their work, and then the hosts literally go away. They're not left st standing around. Uh, two, we eliminated an entire database, so we were able to get rid of about 30 different nodes in our infrastructure, uh, which ended up netting out looking similar to this. So uh, we were able to remove a significant chunk of our infrastructure that basically was <clears throat> a large, uh, not invented here syndrome, uh, Relic, uh, that being our React cluster, was something we weren't good at operating, and something we didn't really know very well, and we just picked off the shelf because we felt a little bit comfortable with it, but it wasn't really our core competency. Uh, our monthly spend, we were able to recover over 10,000 euro just by making this single architectural change. Uh, and then uh, there was a significant reduction in operational complexity. So we're no longer operating a database, we're no longer operating 30 different nodes to implement this React cluster. We fell back to sort of first principles of moving around files, simple events, processing those files elastically, and then throwing away infrastructure when we, when we were done with it. You can see, uh, it's a little bit hard to read, but this is kind of the monthly spend for this particular team. Again, remember, we have visibility into what these individual teams are doing uh, because we've taken the time to tag things. And the monthly spend for this individual team uh, was on a significant downward trajectory. The, the slight uptick at the end of it was when we ingested data for one of AWS's largest customers. We, we brought them on board, and so there was a slight uptick, but we were able to uh, scale that dynamically without changing any of the infrastructure. Uh, our React cluster was no longer on fire, and uh, we were able to take that in stride. As some perspective, this particular infrastructure right now for us, on average, processes about 115,000 pieces of data per second, uh, although that's a very bursty workload. It, it's not constantly sustained at that, so it's more like there'll be a million pieces of data that come in, it'll process it, throw away some infrastructure. There'll be 20 million pieces of data that will come in, we'll process it, we'll throw away some infrastructure. Uh, how this fits into the overall perspective for this individual team. Uh, this is a breakdown of, uh, many people think that when you run an EC2 instance, it's a single line item of cost, it's that it's one particular piece of data. That's not actually the case. There's a lot of nuance that goes into what it means to operate a piece of EC2 infrastructure. And in this particular case, the, the purple uh, zoom in is us no longer operating significant EBS volumes that, are, that were previously attached to that React cluster. Uh, so as some context there, we had effectively had to use large EBS volumes to be able to get the throughput that we needed out of that React cluster, and that was a significant portion of our EC2 spend that we were able to just basically take off the table by simply using S3 when we didn't need a more complicated data store. So the, the second sort of use case in terms of our operational efficiency here was a migration of a, a, a seven terabyte, seven node MySQL data warehouse cluster. <coughs> uh, this was effectively mandated by the fact that uh, we were running RDS for MySQL, and uh, RDS, MySQL RDS has a hard limit of about seven terabytes, so we were basically running out of the ability to add more data to this particular database. And the natural migration for this, in our case, was to move to Amazon Aurora. Uh, this is a, a good example uh, in our environment of using platform native technologies as opposed to trying to operate something ourselves. And so the, the high level takeaway of what we gained by this was, um, our 90th percentile latency for select queries on RDS MySQL was around 360 seconds. Keep in mind, these numbers are not stunning in terms of the 90th percentile latency, but uh, this was a data warehouse, right? So these were offline batch jobs that were effectively being run to denormalize data that would then be written out to a more efficient store to hand off to customers. Um, by virtue of moving just to Aurora, so this was almost no code change, I'll say like maybe a couple lines of code and maybe some configuration changes. Uh, by virtue of moving to Aurora, we were able to get the 90th percentile select latency down to 120 seconds. Uh, there's a notion in terms of RDS MySQL of provisioned IOPS or PI ops. We were able to go from having to pay AWS for 30,000 PI ops to zero because Aurora doesn't have a notion of PI ops and we didn't need that for our capacity with Aurora. Uh, fun fact, side note, uh, AWS will allow you to purchase 30,000 PI ops for RDS MySQL and in reality the MySQL engine can only use 23,000 of those so you can basically buy more than you can even theoretically use with the MySQL engine on RDS. Uh, and then an unintended side effect that uh, was uh, a result of doing this work was that our provision time for an individual replica went from 30 hours on RDS MySQL to seven minutes with Aurora. Uh, this is, if you're not familiar with Aurora, effectively the secret sauce behind it is that there's a distributed file system that is eventually consistent based on a log structured merge approach, and the Aurora engines themselves are just CPU and memory on top of that distributed file system. So spinning up a new replica is really just copying around cache for the new nodes in terms of the read replicas. 
what this meant for us is that we could actually take this data warehouse and be elastic with it, which was something we didn't anticipate out of the gate, but it was a really cool side effect of adopting this platform native technology. So uh, an example of that would be if we had a large batch job that had to hammer the data warehouse, uh, that normally would have taken seven hours on MySQL RDS. We could spin up an Aurora node, we could run through the large batch job, that would take about 20, 30 minutes, and then we could throw that node away for four or five hours uh, because we could spin up replicas so quick. Our DML, or our data manipulation replication time, went from uh, the worst case, or sorry, our 90, 90th percentile replication lag went from seven minutes to 20 milliseconds. Uh, Aurora is very efficient in terms of write replication. Uh, and our failure mode operations got significantly better. So uh, Aurora does a lot of management of partition detection, of election, of master replica failover, things like that, that we had to do manually in, in a <clears throat> RDS MySQL universe. Uh, and if you zoom out a little bit and you look at what does it actually cost us at the end of the day, we ended up spending about 75, or about 25% less to operate the Aurora cluster in terms of dollar for dollar comparisons compared to RDS MySQL. Uh, so the next use case here is uh, a migration of our HBase cluster from I2 to I3 instance families. And uh, I called this, this particular um, story for us platform adaptation. And really what I mean by that is, uh, because we're paying attention to the changes that Amazon is making to their infrastructure, we're looking at the innovation they're doing and we're taking advantage of that in a dynamic, adaptive way, uh, we're able to migrate a specific workload from I2 family to I3 family. Uh, one of the reasons that was compelling, so this is a bit hard to see, but this is effectively a Bonnie output for the local SSDs on the I2s and the I3s. And there's two things that I'll call out. Uh, the first is that the random seek latency improved by an order of magnitude between the I2 and the I3 family. Uh, likewise, then the, the raw numbers improved from, uh, especially on the read side, we got more than a 3x improvement from 580 megabit per second to 128 megabit per second. This is simply by migrating a workload or right-sizing a workload from an I2 to an I3 family. And at a higher level, uh, the hardware is fairly equivalent. So same number of vCPUs, same amount of RAM, uh, the local storage, you actually get more storage, but more importantly, the network interconnect on the i3 family uh, actually gave us a 40 gigabit per second interconnect by moving from i2 to i3. What that meant for us is that we could move away from a thing called placement groups in terms of EC2, uh, which meant that everything was operating in a single AZ and we could move to having a multiple AZ deployment because now the 40 gigabit interconnect removed network bandwidth as a constraint for us. Uh, and then, really, the, so there's a couple of other good side effects here. I'll, I'll skip over the rest of them. But uh, one of the cooler things is that we were able to do this, but also reduce cost at the same time. So however they've managed to do it, Amazon has been able to engineer differences between the i2 and the i3 hardware family uh, and reducing price by um, over $4 per hour. Uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly because we're running shorter on time. But uh, we also undertook a significant containerization effort. And uh, that's effectively everything that's playing on the containerization side. A couple of highlights for us. Uh, really, the reason we set out with this particular containerization initiative is because we had poor utilization on a lot of our EC2 hosts. So if you go back to that notion of we had one workload per VM that would wake up, do a little bit, and then go back to sleep that was largely idle for 75% of the time. By virtue of adopting containers, we were able to move to a bin packing strategy where we would layer workloads on top of each other, get effectively upwards of 75% utilization of those CPUs, for example, on the EC2 hosts that were operating the containers, uh, which on the whole gave us a utilization improvement of uh, over 50% efficiency for the hosts that were backing those containers. And by virtue of turning off the things that were periodically doing work, but not up the full time, that, not, that were not fully utilized, we, are, we were actually able to save 60% uh, in terms of the EC2 infrastructure for this particular workload. Uh, this also got us some cool side effects in terms of being able to do things like blue-green deploys. So our Jenkins deployment right now for a new deployment, we'll ship a new container out, we'll switch back and forth between blue-green deploys, and our Jenkins infrastructure is actually capable of changing an ALB or an application load balancer from the blue deployment to the green deployment. We can do things like automated smoke tests between them. We have a very clear rollback path. Again, all leveraging platform-native capabilities. Um, we made significant use of EC2 spot. So, uh, that was for some specific workloads, so things like time-insensitive map-reduced jobs or EMR jobs. I say time-insensitive EMR jobs because uh, if you're going to run a, an EMR job on spot, you have to be prepared that it's going to go away. That's kind of the caveat of spot. Uh, 
And uh, if you don't engineer accordingly or schedule your workloads accordingly, then you'll get bitten by Spot. Spot has a ton of cost-saving potential, but at the end of the day, if you don't take certain concessions into account, it's ultimately not going to be more efficient for you. You're not going to get things done on it that you need to get done. Uh, the net takeaway for us is that by moving certain workloads to Spot, we are able to save over 40,000 euro per month in terms of uh, what we would be spending on demand. Uh, but again, this requires engineering effort. This isn't something we just get for free uh, by flipping a switch and saying, yes, use Spot in this case. Spot's a lot more complex than that. Uh, there's uh, many, many nuances to doing Spot well, and I won't have time to go through all of them here, but um, effectively, <laughs> we ended up taking a uh, machine learning approach to how we create predictive models around Spot, and then trying to figure out when does it make sense to use Spot given those machine learning uh, models and where we think the Spot market is going, what we think the probability of the likelihood of termination of a Spot instance is. Uh, and this was something that we effectively had to build in-house because we weren't happy with the AWS tools. We didn't get everything we needed out of Spot Block and Spot Fleet, for example. Uh, and then one thing I'll, I'll quickly point out, most people overlook uh, the fundamental basics of Spot in the sense that there's a specific case where you shouldn't use Spot, which is if you have unused RIs. So if you've paid for a reserved instance and you can create a probabilistic model around the fact that you're not going to use that reserved instance, then spending money on Spot is actually going to cost you more in the long run because you should have used the unused reserved instance. Meaning an RI is a sunk cost, you're going to pay for it. You should use that before you should use Spot. But modeling that is a complicated thing. It's not always trivial to figure out, should I use an EC2 instance to take advantage of an unused RI or not? And then uh, lastly, there's an important notion when you operate a SaaS company, so I alluded to this at the beginning of the talk, uh, of what we call gross margin. So as we sell more dollars of software to our customers, there's a non-zero cost to operating our infrastructure. And the delta between that cost, or COGS, cost of goods sold, and top line revenue is what we call gross margin. So if we build up everything we've talked to so far in terms of visibility into the spend, in terms of financial leverage, in terms of optimizing our infrastructure, that has some really cool side effects for us. Uh, we can now start to do things like look at what it costs us to ship an individual feature, uh, look at what it costs us to operate a specific customer, or operate our infrastructure for a specific customer. And this is what I mean when I say we have visibility into unit economics, meaning I can go to my product team and say, this is what it costs to operate our infrastructure for this customer, so what should we be charging that customer? What's the margin that we want to make on this particular feature set? And this lets us make better engineering decisions because we can focus on core competencies and value add as opposed to operating infrastructure. We can figure out where we should focus optimization efforts within our infrastructure. We wouldn't be able to do this if we weren't experienced in doing it already and if we didn't have good visualization and good financial leverage into how we operate our infrastructure. This is really sort of the, the culmination of all the three previous steps. Uh, there's a, a saying in the States that uh, not all it, not everything was roses, meaning not everything went great. There were a ton of uh, lessons learned doing this. Uh, like I said, the rate of change in AWS is staggering. Um, definitely need to be cautious with spending commitments. You can certainly overbuy RIs if you're going to make significant changes to your infrastructure. That's a thing that you have to be careful with. The spot is definitely its own special snowflake, and if you do it wrong, it can end up costing you more money at the end of the day. Um, a couple other cool examples that I won't have time to go into, and then uh, lastly I'll mention, uh, there is one downside theoretically to leaning into these platforms heavily to making more use of the native features, which is vendor lock-in, right? So if I make use of Aurora and there's not an Aurora analog on one of the other platforms, uh, what does that mean if I decide I want to leave AWS? This isn't something that concerned us, but it is something that's probably a concern for several people. So if, you, if I can leave you with one thought, uh, it would be that, um, while we got good at operating data centers and there were certain best practices there, that is not what it looks like to effectively do cloud well. There's a lot of things we have to change as cloud evolves, as the platform offers new features to us. And if we lean into those, if we do those well and become good, op effective operators of public cloud, uh, then we can save a significant amount of money. In our case, we were able to cut our infrastructure costs by over 50%, uh, which is several million dollars a year. I love that because then I can go back to my boss and make the case that I get to hire more engineers. Uh, and this was a good feedback cycle in terms of our product and, and how we fed our own experiences back into our product. So, thanks. Um, thank you very much, Eric. Um, 
We actually are already on time, and as the barbecue is starting to downstairs and you want to collect your vouchers for food, because there are vouchers, so before you go to barbecue, take your vouchers, they are downstairs as well. <coughs> so thank you very much, Eric, but let's take the questions uh, down there and you'll be more efficient. With the beer, it's always better, right? <laughs> cool. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks.